making their way to the ring. Talking about the world of professional wrestling, the team of Jeff Martin and the trendsetter, Brian Perga, the Jersey Ricky crew. I shouldn't really do that head bob, but yeah, because really, somebody's listening to this is going to see you doing head nah, bob, guys. Really. But guys, we're uh, back. Yeah. HSP is back, guys. What's going on? It's the Jersey Reckon Crew. We're back here, HSB Podcast. I am Jeff Martin alongside my tag team partner and soon to be flying to Chicago correspondent, the trendsetter, Brian Berger. What's going on, man? How you doing? What how I'm doing, Jeff? Uh, I like to say I'm doing great, but you know, the tension of flying, I don't like. I'm not a big flyer. I don't like doing it. I know you gotta go from place to place. You gotta do that. It's the fastest way to get there, but I guess it's to, to get me ready for uh, a busy summer and a busier fall that we're going to have. I don't want to think about the fall right now, but excited and, and also a little stressed, to be, to be honest with you. You got to have – the key to me is you got to have a good night's sleep. You got to have mm, – that never happens for me. I never no, get a good night's sleep the night before. You tend to pack the, the morning of, right? I think it's me. You do too. You know, I think, I think a lot of people are last minute packers because you always feel you have so much stuff you got to bring with you because you don't want to forget it. And then we all tend to overpack and pack last minute because, you know, lazy and yeah, it's just laziness basically. But uh, I'm not taking a lot with me, just my bag and my, my equipment. So yeah, it's a it, quick I'm not, trip, right? Yeah. Quick I'm not, business I'm, trip. I'm not stressed in terms of my equipment or what I'm bringing with me or what I have to bring and in terms of batteries or this or that, but it's more just the stress of physically going there waiting for the event to start and then the real stress for people who've never done interviews before or, 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 or looking to do that is planning out your route because nothing ever works the way you plan it so like a particular person is supposed to be here at this particular time they're not there then you want to make sure you beat the rush because as soon yeah. as one person is getting a lot of people doing signings and pictures you don't want to interrupt them because then if you say hey can i have two minutes of your time two minutes is money out of their pocket yeah. so that's what makes us stress. So, so we'll talk about where you're going in just a few minutes yeah. here. Uh, you can follow us on all our social media at High Spot Podcast. Follow the Instagram, HSP Media Network, and go on the YouTube, download, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Subscribe, go God damn it. YouTube.com slash High Spot Podcast. We've got great things going on there. I'll make some announcements after the show here, uh, before the end of the show. Uh, about uh, some new stuff going on with the YouTube channel. So definitely, you know, stay tuned for that, uh, please, because we love you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, why don't you just stay? And, we love you. you know, it's, it's that call in the radio business, that tease. Makes you want to stay in the moment. Yeah. Uh, but how much the radio business helped us out. And we yeah. learned those particular things. From um, I want to talk about Trendsetter. And we have lots to talk about, too. We got your money bet in the we bank do. preview. We got Slammiversary, too. We'll get into that. Uh, stuff going around the E as uh, we keep it short there. WWE stuff. But uh, let's start with AEW. One million viewers over one million. I don't want to, you know. You know, shortchange them. Over a million viewers tuned in AEW Fighter Fest Night One. Yeah. Uh, improvements, and I don't want to take anything away from one million viewers, but I mean, if you go back in the day, one million viewers, a one point oh two five rating would get you fired. But now we're praising uh, a million viewers. I get that. I get that it's summer. I get that this is a huge step in the right direction. But a million viewers, just to me, being an old school guy, you know, I don't know if I would really brag about it. But if they're going to, and everyone's patting on the back, congratulations, AEW, a million viewers, Fighter Fest Night One. Well, yeah, again, Jeff, you know, we're we're not the demographic anymore. It's something we have to understand. I know it's taken me a long time to accept that for myself, but it, it is true. We're no longer on the demographic as being a die hardcore. Where you're right, back in the past during the golden age of wrestling in my lifetime, which is the Monday Night Wars, that's nothing. But, you know, coming back from COVID, having people finally in the stands, feeling that energy from the audience, seeing that spontaneity and seeing the the feeling, you know, that that wonderful formula that Eric Bischoff designed where, you know, surprises happen here and there. And everybody, you can definitely tell, is taking their game to the next level because that crowd is in the audience. It's a win-win. It really is a win-win. So I'll be positive. I don't want to sound like you yeah. Know, don't sound like oh, me. That's my job. Fart a Debbie Downer. They got over a million my views. Job. Their product is right now to me on a different level compared to the other shows. 
So, you know, a p- huge pat on the back, man. And they're doing a tremendous job with their sales uh, when they come into the Tri-State area. That event at Arthur Ashe is pretty much sold out. Uh, the Parental Center, they'll be uh, in our area, too, right before that event the week before. So right now they're on a roll, man, and they continue that momentum with a tremendous, to me, uh, night one of Fighter Fest uh, in Austin, Texas. And, you know, I think that that opening match, I, like I said last week, what impresses me about them is it just seems the pacing and their matches back to back seem to really work for me. And they seem to just create that buzz and that energy that you don't see. There's not a down period with AEW. And I'll start off. You open up with the IWGP US Championship match between John Moxley and Carl Anderson. You know, it's the return of Moxley. The crowd is pumped. They want to see this Texas crowd is good. Austin crowd is good. And then not only that, but then you go into another title match where it's a big time feel because Ricky Starks, who the crowd loves, turns on Brian Cage. Team Taz turns on him. We got a new FTW champion. I don't know if like, you know, you'd recognize that because I don't know if AW recognizes that championship, but uh, they do. And they turn on Brian Cage. Brian Wait, who, Cage. Who, who recognizes that championship? I don't know if AEW no, no, does. No, he does. No, yeah. So, <laughs> so you have another plot twist, right? You go from Moxley to Anderson, and then you go into this, and you have another plot twist where you're like, okay, cool. Brian Cage, to me, had a lot of babyface tendencies. And I think now that he's going to be separated from Team Taz, I think he's another guy that can get to that main event level or should be in the echelon of people who should be given a shot and opportunity but you kind of felt that feeling that brian cage was kind of going in that direction towards being a baby face yeah you're right he had those tendencies where it looked like he was going in that direction mm-hmm. but you know he's done interviews in the past where i've listened to him as he was in the height of being on team taz being crowned the ftw champion trying to be that i guess you could say if we're comparing it to wwe that brock lesnar yeah. bobby lashley type of guy that dominant guy who just bulldozes over everybody although it, it, that wasn't the case when it came to facing guys like John Moxley for the AW championship, but you're right. He's even admitted to himself that he enjoys being the baby face more. He enjoys being cheered more, being the fan favorite. than he is being the bad guy. Now me personally, I like being the bad guy. I think there's a lot more freedoms with that. So I much think, fun. Man. I think, yeah, it's so, so much, much fun, fun. And you have so many abilities of, 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 just trying things and seeing how they work as opposed to you're, you're I feel like sometimes you're handcuffed to being a baby face because there's certain things you can and cannot do. Uh, if you want to be the cool baby face, the cool bad guy, whatever the case might be, but you're right. Uh, I think eventually saw this move happening and it just wasn't working. Uh, we wanted Taz to be that mouthpiece for Brian cage and he was to a certain degree. And then all of a sudden Brian had a voice of his own and it just didn't click. It didn't mesh with team Taz. And I think it's going to be best for both of them, but now it's going to be a, a huge test for Brian cage. See how he is standing on his own two feet, him being his own mouthpiece. And they go after that. You get that huge change there where again, switch places, Brian cage will become the face and you had a big developing story. And what happens after that? Cody Rhodes comes out all decked in white. The good guy coming in and calling out Malachi Black for what we did last week to Arn Anderson. And, you know, we kind of don't like going off script. We, we kind of like go off script a little bit. But I'm just running down here because I have to set the example of how everything progressed. Because you went from, again, Moxley Anderson. Then you went Starks, Cage, changing in, uh, of the title, uh, changing in uh, babyface and heel. And then after that, you're thinking, okay, I can take a breath. I can go to the bathroom. No, you can't yeah. because you're going to get Cody and Malachi Black confrontation in the ring. Malachi Black in the black and Cody in the white. Good versus evil. They were so detailed. It was so good. Malachi Black in two weeks has done more than he's done in his entire career in WWE. Uh, that goes without a question. He has definitely done more in just the first night than he did in, in most likely his entire time in the main roster in yeah. WWE. And that's the truth. But uh, it's interesting here because you're right. They have the, the two noticed uh, factors there. Cody dressed in all white, Malachi black and all black, good versus evil type scenario. So it'll be... It'll be a fun dynamic to, to see where it goes, but uh, the biggest thing is to see Malachi Black and Cody Rhodes in the ring, and that's going to be something you know that the fans are anticipating, so am I. And um, what can I say? I'm just happy for Malachi Black to see him yeah. finally be given uh, an opportunity to be creative, an opportunity to sprout 
those, you know, those wings of creativity. I mean, you know, it, that, I think that's what, if we do compare the two brands, whether it be WWE uh, and AEW, it just really feels, although sometimes AEW does feel chaotic at times. Uh, it's good chaotic. Is, it's good chaotic, but sometimes you can get out of control and you do need people to rein that in because sometimes it's just a little overboard and kind of is ridiculous at times for me. But to have that freedom, that ability to say, all right, let's try this. Let's try this. It could be a home run or it could be a complete failure, but at least you have that opportunity to learn from it. And, and it's great to see this uh, opportunity for Malachi Black and, again, another opponent for Cody because the biggest thing with Cody for me and my concern is that I always kind of get afraid that eventually he's going to get lost in the shuffle because he made that promise he was no longer going to compete for, yeah, but for the AEW not, Championship. Though. I know, but still, at the same time, you still want him to be relevant. And these these the scenario here just makes him, again, right back up there in relevancy. All right, so I'm not a huge fan, but I get what they're doing because this is why they're smart. This is why they make the big bucks, why they're the EVPs, why Tony Khan is who he is. I'm really not into Christian Cage versus Matt Hardy match because it's just too WWE to me. And then you hear Jim Ross doing the match, and you're like, wow, this is really WWE for me, too, WWE for me. But you know why they're smart, Trendsetter? You know why this match worked and Christian Cage gets the victory over Matt Hardy? Do you know why this works? Do you know why this is the, This is why AEW put this match on? Going to just stare at me blank and... Well, I'm waiting. <laughs> well, <laughs> here it is, Trendsetter, because if you're a novice fan of wrestling and you don't know what's going on here between WWE and AEW, you have never heard of AEW and you're watching TNT and you see Christian Cage versus Matt Hardy and Jim Ross is on the mic calling the match. What are you thinking? I'm watching WWE, right? Yeah. Oh, they're on here. Wait a minute. That's not WWE. That's AEW. Oh, I didn't know this. Oh, they're there. Gets that novice fan that has no idea what's going on. When they see these familiar faces in the ring, you're like, okay, wait a minute. Okay, so this could be W. No, it's not. Jim, but Jim Ross is there. It's AEW, and you get a fan. You get that novice fan there because they have two recogn recognizable names, and boom, there you go. Really smart by AEW. I did not understand it until I was watching the match where I was like, man, this is so WB. But that's the point because this is going to attract that fan that doesn't know AEW when they see these stars. Boom. Oh, I'm going to give this a chance. I mean, I get your point, but part of me, I, I would say I don't agree with AEW on this just because you're right. I mean, you made the point where, you know, if somebody's watching it, a novice fan or somebody in general has never seen the product before, look at it and immediately think, oh, this is WWE. I'm going to watch this. Maybe have another show on TNT. And all of a sudden they realize, oh, this is a whole different league. But to me, what I always felt the importance was when you brought guys in like Christian Cage or Matt Hardy was to elevate other talent and not necessarily have to put guys over. But when you see a Christian Cage, you automatically, even if he's not in the ring with Matt Hardy, you think, oh, WWE. And who is this guy he's wrestling? I've never seen this guy before. And that's kind of how you build it up. Same scenario with Matt Hardy. So, yes, I get what you're saying in terms of your point of why they did it and then Jim Ross is calling it. But, you know, for me, for, for a company that always – you know, not always, but who had publicly came out and said, we're not trying to copy WWE. We're not trying to, you know, you know, run off their momentum in terms of, you know, signing guys that have been fired and then using stuff that they've done in the past and WWE programming and use it on our show. They're kind of doing that though. You know why? It's too tempting. It's too tempting because if you're a company and you see Miro and you see Aleister Black and you see, this guy and that guy. WWE didn't just fire like jobbers, right? They fired, yeah. you know, mid level talent, upper tier talent, you could say, to, to some aspects, to some of the wrestlers. How could you not be tempted to not dip into that bag? Because, but that's, man, that's where the challenge, there. but that's where the challenge lies, right? Because you can only be so tempted so much as to acquire this talent that has been underutilized in WWE, right? But then on the back burner, too, what was it two weeks ago? We talked about guys like MJF, Jungle Boy, you know, um, Darby Allen. Guys are trying to make names for themselves to be the face of AW for the next 10 years. I mean, the next 10 years, we're not going to see Christian Cage. Uh, oh. I know Mira still uh, is still, he's not up there in age in terms of the twilight of his career, but, you know, he's an established star and we need to kind of address that talent. Long story short, I just don't think putting Matt Hardy and Christian does any benefit to. 
the brand as opposed that here we have two guys who in their primes and back in their in the days in WWE were part of two tag teams and now they're here at the twilight of their careers uh, trying to recapture lightning in a bottle. I just don't think that works. How badass is that TNT championship, by the way? Miro, great job. Miro is doing a tremendous job because, damn it, he's been given the chance, man. I mean, God's the favorite champion, yeah. the Redeemer. Ugh. You know, we criticized him a little bit in the beginning, right? Because he was with, uh, in, involved in this uh, marriage angle again with Penelope Ford, Kip Sabian. We were kind of disappointed. But the best thing that happened was him moving away from that because now he's allowed to be creative. And I don't know how you feel about it, but that Redeemer, the God's favorite champion, just his style now, he's a legitimate monster. I don't see that title reign ending anytime soon. And that championship is badass. No, no, and yeah, I've seen the title too. It looks really good compared to the first version yeah, of it, right? Yeah. Anything's better than the first version. Oh. And, you know, the second one looked really good too. But here it's just, you know, apples and oranges can't compare, right? It's, it's, it looks great. It really does for the TNT title. Um, but for Miro, you're right. I mean, again, I never was trying to, you know, hinder in terms of thinking that Miro deserved that opportunity. He did. He never got a fair share in terms of taking the ball and running with it and seeing if he could hit home run or he could fail. I mean, I'm using all these baseball analogies. It's true. He has that ability. He has that talent. We've seen where he can go with it. Now the question comes that, you know, Lana was just previously on Jericho's podcast. Now, basically gave it away that she's going to basically gave it away. They're signing. Do you pair those two together? Yeah. Do we do the same scenario where, oh, it worked in WWE. Let's put them together again. I think it would be, although it would make great sense because Lana is a very good talker and she could be the mouthpiece again like she was in WWE for Miro. I think Miro needs the opportunity just to be his own man. He really does. And he's doing a great job. It was kind of shaky on him for a little bit, but it seems like he's coming into his own. Great to see. And that's what you want. You want to see a star who's been established for quite a bit on, on television and now have another opportunity to reestablish himself to a brand new audience, and have the ability to showcase what he's learned throughout the beginning when he started in NXT, to where he was in W programming, to where he is in AEW right now. So we get the main event, Darby Allen and uh, All Ego Ethan Page in a coffin match. I don't know. I were you looking that, forward to this? By the way, was this something that no? When they, they built it up, up well, they hyped it up well. Yeah, enough. it was the built up enough to keep you somewhat interested. Oh, in uh, I, I told you in the beginning, I'm not a Darby Allen fan. I respect his work because no one busts his ass more than Darby Allen, especially at his size. You know, he has to go a little bit more than most other people, so he's got to give it more, and he does every time. So, uh, I'm not a fan of Darby Allen. I told you because I just don't think he could be legitimate looking. Uh, it's not believable a to you. A heavyweight. You believe in character, that's fine if he wants to challenge for you know other titles or in a tag team maybe. But I just I, I just don't see him being leading man. I don't see him being that guy, even though you know the kids will wear the uh the face paint. You got a lot of comparisons to Jeff Hardy. But at the end of the day, how how long has Jeff Hardy held a world title? I mean, right? I mean, how long has he had a reign? How long has been his reigns as champion been? So as much as you want to see the title on the guy. You know, I, so just some people to me aren't that kind of material. And again, not, not not being offensive because I respect the hell out of Darby Allen. But going into this match here, they, the buildup was really good. I just think that the wrong person kind of lost because you could play off Darby Allen's losing here to Ethan Page. Ethan Page is fresh face. You kind of wanted to see him, you know, after all the talking that he did uh, with Darby Allen, saying that he was going to end him and this feud that's been going on ever since in the independent circuit. Kind of wanted to see Ethan Page get the best of him here on this occasion. So as much as I look forward to that coffin drop was sick, I wanted to see Ethan Page go with the victory here. Yeah, well, I agree. I want to see Ethan Page win, but for different reasons, though. It was not because uh, of the payoff in terms that, you know, the way they were building up the story, you could definitely tell they were leaning towards Darby Allin finally getting retribution against Page because of everything they had gone through in terms of their history they talked about in the independent scene. I felt this was going to be the start of a new rivalry. It was going to be a scenario. Let's take you back to the day in ECW, for example, right? When Tommy Dreamer and, Ra and Tommy Dreamer, Tommy Dreamer, not Reaver, Tommy Dreamer, <laughs> Tommy Dreamer and Raven were the hottest thing in ECW. And mm -hmm. just Tommy Dreamer could not get the victory over Raven. No matter what happened, it was always, he was always unable to beat him. Mm -hmm. And when he finally did, it meant something. So I thought they were going to go that route where Paige is going to win the coffin match. They're going to say, ah, we've we've done away with uh, Darby Allen. He just keeps coming back and coming back. And it's like that little fly that just won't go away. And finally, 
he gets his opportunity at, you know, who knows, all out. It might have been a, a nice scenario in Chicago to kind of end that rivalry, but maybe it will continue. But to me, from a storyline standpoint, I would have liked that to happen just to continue this on because those two have really good chemistry together. Uh, they really do. And again, that coffin drop at the end to me was uh, obviously the nail in the, the coffin. Nail in the coffin to <laughs> wink, <Page>. wink. <laughs> uh, so very entertaining. Again, and I laugh at my own jokes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Because you're 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 that funny, Joseph. You're that funny of a guy. So a very successful it's, night it's one. <laughs> no, I am. I'm really lying. You stink. Yeah. Uh, so a successful night one. Like shower, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you won't let me get the last laugh in. You always got to add that shot. That's why I love you. Because you make it too easy, man. Wow. You really do. You just you can't outdo me and outwit me in the last remarks. I always get you. I always get you. So before we ramble on here, we got it's too late for week, that. Next week we've got night two of Fighter Fest, and one of the matches there is going to be Chris Jericho and Sean Spears going at it. It's the first five of the labors of Jericho, chapter one. We got. Spears and Jericho trendsetter. I know Jericho's happy because he can shoot a a promo earlier in the day, and so they can use it while he's touring with Fozzy. How yes. awesome is that, man? Awesome. I, I want to catch a Fozzy show. I know we saw it on the cruise, but I want to see them live somewhere. So if they ever hit up anywhere around here, we're definitely going. Even if I got to drive down to Pittsburgh, I'm 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 willing to do it. But uh, definitely want to see Fozzy live. But That's you get the first right there. You got the first of of five here for Chris Jericho. Uh, man, MJ, MJF is such a heel here. And the the stipulation is that Sean Spears can use a chair. Chris Jericho cannot. So we'll see what happens next week. And then also for the AEW Women's Championship, we've got Britt Baker defending that title against Nyla Rose. So night two is going to be as packed as night one. And AEW continues putting on these matches that folks are really, you know, it's highly anticipated and folks are really looking forward to. Of just, course they're looking is. forward to it because they're invested into it. And, you know, as much as you want to say, this is Nyla Rhodes, what, third, fourth Rose, yeah. Rose, oh. not Rhodes, is Cody Rhodes. No. But um, can you just let me have it, Jeff? Please? No, no, because someone will let you have it on, on social media. So might as well have me call you out. Whatever. I'm done. <laughs> no, but it's like she's had this opportunity several times and has failed, but ultimately it's still refreshing because you've seen where Britt Baker has started, where the struggle she had, now where she's evolved herself into, I hate to say, maybe a fan favorite now because it's just been that over that character as the role model as Britt Baker DMD. So a different feel here, but ultimately looking forward to it because people are invested into it. Same thing with Jericho and you know Sean Spears. Not that anybody's invested in Sean Spears. I know I'm not. <laughs> but in terms of the stipulations, because ultimately this is all for what? Jericho to get an opportunity at MJF. The same thing we saw with Cody when he wanted to get his hands on his scrawny little neck. He had to go through <laughs> all this. He went through that whooping. He, he got a whooping. He got some backslash and he went through all this just to get an opportunity to face MJF. And that showcases the fact that how important is MJF, right? You have to go yep. through all this just to get an opportunity mm -hmm. to face him. It's great. Great work. All right. Money in the Bank is this Sunday. Again, we've talked a lot about AEW, but we got to heap AEW some praise, of course. But now we get Money in the Bank. The first time fans are back uh, for a major event, for pay-per-view event. Uh, in Texas as well. So we've got a huge uh, main event, the uh, Money in the Bank ladder match on the men's and women's sides. And also, too, we've got uh, the uh, other titles on the line. But let's get into the men's Money in the Bank. And you see the list of names. you got Kevin Owens, Drew McIntyre, Riddle, Ricochet, John Morrison, Biggie, King, King Shinsuke, and Seth Rollins. That's a mouthful. But, I mean, right Say now. Again. No, I, I, I'm not going to even make an attempt Come to. On, man. <laughs> I, I what? <laughs> no, I'm what? joking with you. Oh, um, so I, I look at these matches, and is it wide open? I don't think so because you can cross off a few people here. Yeah, you want to say maybe Biggie? Uh, that would be great because he's taking that next next step, even though the IC title reign was yeah. And then you've got guys like Ricochet. You know, aren't gonna you know aren't gonna win this. You know, I don't think a surprise like that would make sense. And you got Seth Rollins there who's probably the obvious guy because you're like, yeah, why not? Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, eventually one day cashing it in. But then you have that lurking matchup with Edge at SummerSlam. So 
is there a clear cut winner here or do you really have to think about who's going to walk away with the money in the bank briefcase on the men's side? Uh, for me, it's a clear cut winner. I think it's oh. Drew McIntyre. I think that oh. they're really still <laughs> as much as you want to shake oh. your head, shake your no head. No more stories. I think, for God's I think sake. they have, you have to, I know the, the wings of uh, the Loch Ness monster. Part of the sword is made of the locks of the Loch Ness monster. Oh yeah. But I think the mere fact they built up that storyline where, he can no longer challenge Bobby Lashley. You know, Bobby Lashley is going to the rivalry now. He'll, we'll talk about later with uh, uh, Kofi Kingston and who knows who will face at SummerSlam. But I, I feel that it's, it's going to be there because if Roman Reigns successfully defends his title, that leads to the opportunity that Drew McIntyre can get it. Here's the thing. I, Kevin Owens, I think here right now he's just in wrestling purgatory. Ricochet, he's been in purgatory since uh, Vince just saw something he didn't like and no longer wanted to do anything with him. Uh, the wild card could be, you know, um, it can't be Morrison. Seth, you made a good point there too, but I think they're really saving that till maybe later on for maybe a WrestleMania match. Um, who else is out there? Shinsuke? I mean, no, nah, except can Shinsuke can make a, can a, make a, a case now? No, nah, nah, Riddle. I don't know. Riddle could be the wild card here, and the fact that he's gotten this huge push. There's already been, you know, news documented the fact that that the the whole thing in his past where he was dealing with some legal issues have now kind of gone away. Been cleared, yeah, They've been cleared. Dropped so. His lawsuit. They've kind of tested him. They felt they've pushed him in his direction. I think he's done as much people might think it's sophomore work. He's done some pretty great stuff with Randy Orton, and who knows if this might continue. That could be a possible storyline right there. Riddle could win the Money in the Bank match, and that would be a that would be a huge wow. Look at this. It would be a great momentum swing for not just Riddle in his career, but for WWE programming the live audience to finally get that thing that they were anticipating to see a guy like Riddle win the title. Or so not you, win but Money you in pick the Bank. you're picking Drew though. I'm picking Drew, but right. it, again, that would be the wild card in my right. mind. And I'm Riddle. picking Biggie, so we'll see what happens there. Okay. We go to the women's Money in the Bank ladder match, uh, and it's going to be interesting because you've got Alexa Bliss. Of course, she's at the forefront. You've got Asuka, Naomi. Uh, you've got Liv Morgan, Natalia, Zelina Vega, and, of course, Nikki uh, Ash, uh, almost <laughs> superhero. Um, look, this to me is maybe a little bit more clear cut. Yeah, uh, you know who I would love to win this thing and Nikki stick it up everyone's asses, and that's Zelina Vega. Yeah, I would be tremendous and as a heel that she's playing. Look, Oscar's done it all right now. Natalia, she's the women's tag team champion. Um, you know, Alexa Bliss, uh, does she need that money in the bank? That's the funny thing, with Alexa Bliss, right now in this new evolution of her character. Even despite the evolution of her character, even she wasn't doing this version of Alexa Bliss. Jeff, I think she's even reached the point of maybe like a Charlotte Flair, right? I don't think Alexa really needs the title anymore. She's already no. solidified herself as the main superstar. She doesn't really need it. Plus, her character is on and off. I don't think you want to. Yeah. I think Zelina Vega should have it. I think Zelina Vega is going to do it, and I think she's going to win it. I'm picking my wild card, representing Jersey. Liv Morgan. Oh, man. really? Because yeah. here's the thing. You're right. I, I agree with you about Selena Vega, but Liv Morgan is is has shown that she just needs an opportunity. And let's just give her one. Let's give her a shot. Let's give her an opportunity. Let's you know because they've had moment times where they've used her in the Riot Squad didn't work out. They let go of half the members of the Riot Squad, especially Ruby Wright. Ruby Wright came back from yeah. injury. Yeah, Ruby, Ruby Wright came back from injury. Now they're back to the Riot Squad where they're trying to give Liv Morgan a legitimate singles push. Now you let go of Ruby Wright. Now she's bars. Let's let's see this go all the way through. Let's let's try something different. As much as I'm a fan of Selena Vega, it, let's try something different let's here. Try something different. That's why. Vega. That's why I threw the riddle scenario. Although I think Drew McIntyre is going to win it, and although I I agree that it's probably leaning towards Selena Vega. Let's try something. New. Let's try Liv Morgan. Let's see if the crowd, especially the audience there. Will be rooting for, her. and I think again, in a scenario like this, it's so important for this event to have that ability of of not having to be so predictable, Jeff. And I yeah. hope they go that route. All right, so you got Liv Morgan, I got Zelina Vega, yes. and we move on to the Universal Championship matchup between Roman Reigns and Edge. First time ever, Paul Heyman will he pay, play an integral role? We will find out. But the question to me is here. Is they're obviously planting the seeds between Edge and Seth Rollins. Will Seth Rollins cost Edge here and still have Roman Reigns walk away the champion? And, you know, nothing really bad happens if Edge loses because of Seth Rollins' interference. But Edge said something 
in an interview, I think if it was on the bump or on something where he said that he realizes that time is, is, is getting short, you know, borrowed time maybe. And we're not going to see too many more of these, you know, edge matches. So we got to savor them. Right. Mm -hmm. So is there end game to have edge have one last title run or, is this all about building the legacy, building the steam, building the momentum of Roman Reigns and an eventual showdown with The Rock as early as Survivor Series in November? Could you see Edge come away with it? Because as much as, you know, this match is really good and maybe Edge could win this and Roman Reigns gets it back, I just don't see the uh, reason for there to be a title switch. I think Roman Reigns wins here. But could you make a case for Edge if you had to? Well, I think honestly, Jeff, you answered the question for me. I'll, ah, I'll throw it back again to you. That. Yeah, that's all right, but you, you, I'll, I'll, I'll throw that again with a question to you, which you, you somewhat answered though. Does Edge really need the championship at this point in his career? Has he not solidified himself as he's a Hall of Famer now? Mm -hmm. He solidified his legacy. Roman Reigns, guys like Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins, although I, he annoys the crap out of me, Seth Rollins. Mm -hmm. These guys are going to be the staples for the next five to ten years if they last that long, especially Roman Reigns. That's what they're hoping for. So a guy like Gage is just here, I feel, when he talks about ending things on his terms of, of you're not going to see that many more edge matches. It's basically him just showing that the last time he retired and he was forced to retire, he even talked about it in interviews before where he was like, he was looking at hopefully dropping the title to Christian and then going off into the sunset and joining the rest of his life. Because his career was cut in the way he didn't want to, he retired as the world champion. So he doesn't need the title anymore. It doesn't really make or break or, or make it any more prestigious, especially the run that Roman Reigns has been on. So I feel, yes, I think this is more just to solidify Roman. And you start asking the question, like, how many more legends is he going to go through? We have two more probably in John Cena and The Rock, right? So those are the ones we're waiting for to see what might happen. But I think this is all setting up for the fact that Roman again is going to prove how dominant he is as a universal champion. And it's going to show that, you know, there was a couple of times, I think last, last SmackDown where uh, Seth and edge had, had a moment because, you know, for people who have a short term memory, you know, when edge was dealing with his neck injury and was retired, you know, there was a scenario when uh, Seth was part of the authority was threatening to re injure edge and break his neck again. So they have some unfinished business here. So I think it's all leading to that. So, yeah, Edge doesn't need the title. This is only going to build up Roman Reigns as head of the table, the travel chief, whatever you want to call it. Travel chief, not cheap. Yeah, uh, He might be cheap on tips right now but um, because he's making yep. so much money. But I think it's leading to that, and uh, we're going to eventually see Seth and Edge down in the, in the near future. All right, so you got these two other matches. You got the WWE Championship on the line, Bobby Lashley and Kofi Kingston, and we will give you our picks that on via social media, so make sure you tune in, uh, tune in this weekend. We will make our prediction on the Bobby Lashley Kofi Kingston match, and also, too, on the WWE Raw Tag Team titles, uh, AJ Styles and Amos against the Viking Raiders. We uh. will give you our predictions uh, on social media, so make sure you follow us on all our social media at iSpot Podcast and HSP Media Network on the Instagram Go to youtube.com slash highspot podcast. Our predictions will be there for you on those two matches. We definitely want to stay, uh, uh, I'm going to say, want to stay abreast of all the news, uh, with HSP. Okay. So make sure that, uh, you know, you follow us on social media, get two predictions there. If you're actually going to go to DraftKings and want to take our advice, <laughs> And I wouldn't okay. recommend yeah. it, but okay, yeah. give so, it a shot. So those two matches will be there and we'll get to, we won't ask for royalties we'll, on we'll that case. To, yeah. We'll get to Kofi and, and Bobby. Too. Good Jeff. You know why? Cause you don't want me to talk about AJ styles. No, no on this. No, not enough no, time in the I'm, show to talk about. I almost it. cursed under my breath <laughs> about AJ styles, the way he's been. You can curse. Go ahead. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> All right. Oh, good <laughs> to get exactly. out of it. Fuck AJ like. styles. What are you doing? Mm. Uh, so, so, You'll have our predictions there for those two. We'll get to Slamversary in just a little bit, but let's go around the uh, E trendsetter. And I, you know what? I wasn't going to lead in with this, but I am going to because I am very upset. I am very upset because how could you freaking trade Mandy Rose to NXT and actually who is the GM? Is Adam Pierce making this trade and trade for Aaliyah? This is nothing against Aaliyah. We're so happy she's been there for six years. You know what that's like? Six years in NXT, and you're thinking, am I going to get the call? Are they going to release me? Uh, you know, uh, And you're thinking, am I good enough? 
You finally are going up there. To do what? I don't know. But you can say that you made it to the main roster. Congratulations, Aaliyah. But my question is, you were talking to me before about how they're going to do this draft in October, right? They said September. Now it's October. Whenever. Whenever the hell they decide to have this freaking draft. Yeah. All right. Whenever they, whenever they decide to have this fucking draft. All right. Here's the thing to you. You asked me, how do they make this legitimate? How can we start taking this seriously? And we went on a nice little conversation. I wish we had the uh, at least the mics on or something so because we, we had a nice little back and forth. And you yeah. said to me, how can you make this legitimate? Here's one way where they F it up so fucking bad, Trendsetter, because you've got Manny Rose, who has got a face for TV, who you want to see her on a Monday or Friday night on national TV, and you're going to put her on NXT TV. I have nothing against NXT. They want to call themselves the third brand. They don't want to call themselves developmental. You know what? You demoted Mandy freaking Rose. And you had a good thing going with her and Dana Brooke. No matter if you want to critique that or not, they had a thing going. They worked. At least they had They were the Hollywood going, yeah. effing blondes version 2.0. And you send Mandy Rose down to NX freaking T. Are you freaking out of your mind, WWE? I'm sorry, but it just makes no sense to me how you send her and you basically demote her down where you th- where honestly we thought she was doing a decent job with Dana Brooke vying for those tag team titles against Natalia and Tamina. And you know what? No, it doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything. Two and a half weeks, three weeks for the buildup. That uh, means nothing. Because they traded freaking Mandy Rose to NX freaking T. Well, isn't this what the, always the frustration is? Son Jeff? of a bitch. Exactly. Isn't this the same frustration we deal with every single time that you have two individuals in Mandy Rhodes and Dana Brooke? Sorry, Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke. And you have finally something going. It's not productive. There really is probably no future in it, but at least it's something for those two individuals to do who I have garnered tremendous respect for both women because, granted, you're not going to love what they do in the ring, but they have personalities, especially Mandy, where you just said it too. She has a look about her that you would love to see on Raw or SmackDown, and you send her down to NXT. So not only do you now demote Mandy Rhodes, but you basically demote it and now rose but now you've basically i'm bad at that but now you've basically <laughs> put dana brooke in a bad spot because now she's probably going to be nervous and waiting for that call to say good luck in your future endeavors that's what's going to happen basically and there, there's no no other way about it as opposed right. that you know you build this up for no apparent reason and that's why sometimes it's hard to get invested in wwe because they just do that they see something a little something working and you know what change my mind don't want to do it. Move on to something else. It's it's ridiculous too. But you know, back to the draft though, which will happen in October. Can we finally do it the way it's supposed to be done? Can we finally do it? How does it work? Everybody keeps asking, how's it gonna work? Is it gonna work? We're gonna shake things up. You know how you shake things up by legitimately making these brands completely separate. I told you before I, 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 I honestly transitioned to me, I think that the Brand split is ridiculous. It's a stupid idea. Uh, maybe in the beginning when JBL was like, well, it causes it causes opportunity. It causes brand. At the end of the day, they don't follow it. They don't stick to it. So uh, to me, honestly, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna make your point. But honestly, I don't see the the reason why we still have a a brand split, especially when they're gonna do super shows on the road. Trends that are gonna do live super shows on the road together. So why have the brand split? I mean, yeah, why have it to begin with? But if you're going to do it and you want to make it successful, for the love of God, live up to what you're saying and make them make them separate shows. Make them have nothing to do with each other because, like you just said, it hasn't worked. It probably won't work, and I'm just basically just spewing off a lot of stuff and jargon that people have heard before, and it's not going to get done. It's not going to be applied, but it's like literally, can you try to make this somewhat legitimate it's impossible to have competition within yourself, but if you're going to do it, do it right. Because here's the thing. As much as we talked about Mandy being sent down to NXT, it does work. The formula is there because NXT, regardless of whether you call it developmental or not, is a separate brand and it lives in its own entity. It doesn't recognize what Raw and SmackDown do. It doesn't mention them, never brings them up, never brings up superstars of them. You don't have superstars coming in and out of NXT. You had maybe during WrestleMania weekend. Okay, I can understand that. I can live with that because it's WrestleMania. We're trying to build up all these new storylines and make it interesting. During Survivor Series, all right. But you know what? 
do away with that. I don't want any of these brands touching each other. You have on SmackDown them recapping Raw and then Raw recapping SmackDown. No, they don't exist. Be your own separate entity. But again, it's going to fall on deaf ears. That's always fallen on before. This whole thing is going to be a scenario. Like, okay, well, one week we'll see this person, and then three weeks or four weeks down the road, because it doesn't work, we're going to have them back on the show again, and they're going to interchange each other, and, and it's going to be meaningless. So whatever Vince or Creative want to do is the uh, W draft, completely pointless. I don't care. And again, what did they trade? They basically traded Mandy for Aaliyah. And for, what, two-round draft picks next year? I mean, again, yeah, no. if you're trying to compare the sports and someone make it legitimate, it, it makes no sense because in terms of value, you're not getting value and I'm about back. to say Aaliyah, Aaliyah hasn't proven anything. Many has someone proven herself on the main roster, proven herself as a com- as a commodity to whatever brand, and now you can just send her back to the minors in a sense. Okay. All right, Fightful.com is reporting that Goldberg is going to be the guy to challenge Bobby Lashley at SummerSlam. So predictions... Whatever you kind of know where they're leading to at, at Money in the Bank, right? So that's why you know, why, you know, to review whatever because we kind of kind of know where it's going. So Goldberg again is going to be put in a situation where he dropped the title of Braun Strowman at WrestleMania. Uh, okay, and then I think that's it. We haven't seen him since, right? No, he faced Drew McIntyre for the oh, WWE Drew Championship. McIntyre. Okay, yeah. All right. So it, to, it's funny that they have this WCW guy here. And they hold him in su- such high regard that they're going to put him out there again at, at, at the age of, I would say, 55 now. And he is going to challenge Bobby Lashley. And Brock Lesnar is, I guess they can't work out a deal. But this does not move the needle for me. And the fact that they're going to rely heavily on these mainstays, these established stars, is, is the only, it's, it's the only way they know how to. Let's be honest. I think Andrew Zarian posted it's the only it, it's it's what they're going to go with. And I and I replied back it's the only way they know how. And that's a sad thing because putting a 55-year-old Goldberg in the ring of Bobby Lashley, he doesn't deserve it and it doesn't move the needle for me. And it's funny, right? That they're putting a WCW guy in such in such high regard where you had a guy like Sting they didn't care. When you had, but Goldberg moves the needle for them in their own world. I don't see it, man. Well, to me, it's just the name value, the recognition of what Goldberg once was, of what he once was, and they're still riding on that to save them. Because right now, as much as he said, yeah, you know, Sting's a WCW guy, they didn't care anything about him. As much as I respect Sting and now what he's doing in AEW, Jeff, Sting wasn't the big draw in WCW. I don't care what anybody says. Yes, was he the face of WCW? Was he the cornerstone of WCW? Yes, but when you look at WCW and you talk about WCW, Goldberg is one of the top five people you say when you relate what WCW once was, and that was Goldberg. So, yes, he's going to be 55, most likely 56. I don't know the exact number, but he still has a name, and they want to draw a name out of him. Now, does it, does it do anything for you, though? It doesn't do anything for me. But, again, I've said this before in the beginning of the show. I am not their demographic but you, anymore. But do you think the 12-year-old is going to be moved that it's Goldberg? I don't, I don't Dude, know. The way man. they have done this and they've promoted it and giving you old footage of Goldberg, they want to forget, and they're going to make you forget what happened and how bad of a shape Goldberg looked against Drew McIntyre. And his excuse was going to be Goldberg that he didn't have enough time to prepare for it. So they really want to exhaust Goldberg's contract and basically just have him there to put over one guys. More. I think it's the, it, this, this is a warm match. Yeah, and this will be it. And I feel for Goldberg because there's no more value behind it but they want to make use of the Goldberg name in this one thing they're going to do. You might not like it. You might not think it, it it moves the needle right, and it doesn't for me. But when you say Goldberg, people are going to be somewhat interested. You say John Cena. He's literally past well, his prime. But but again, he's been away. He's, he's coming. prime. Dude, he's, he's in this. Listen, if you're going to tell me, I understand the saying, Jeff, where you're gonna, how you're going to defend this, right? Where they're going to be like, well, you know, people in their 40s are still in their prime. But John Cena right now, when you look at him, he is not going to be there permanently. I know he said, I, I'm, I'm look, very much looking forward to wearing my jorts again. Okay, cool. But for how long? It's not about John Cena anymore. It's not about uh, Brock Lesnar anymore. It's about the guys we just mentioned, like a Roman Reigns, a Seth Rollins, et cetera, et cetera. These are just named value, like The Rock, for example. That's what it's going to be. Now, I'm not comparing The Rock to Bill Goldberg, Jeff, but it's the name value. And if they're going to start now bringing people back into the audience again, as frustrating as it is for you, 
We have to understand this is what they're going to do. Hell, if they could bring Stone Cold Steve Austin back at this day and age, which I would I wouldn't mind because he's probably more entertaining than what we've seen currently on the product. They're going to do that. They need the name recognition because you know what they haven't done is built up more names. Right now, no, you have Roman Reigns, no. Seth Rollins. You tried Drew McIntyre. That didn't work. You can use the excuse we're in a pandemic, but it just didn't work. What else is out there right now? So you need those names. That's why there are no competitors for a guy like Roman Reigns, which is why he has to now solidify himself with guys like Edge. Eventually, down the road, he's going to have to solidify himself with a guy like John Cena, The Rock, and so on and so forth. We need these legends because they haven't built up enough stars with that roster. All right, so we talked about Brock Lesnar being a potential candidate, right? And for some reason, it didn't work out. But there was a Brock Lesnar sighting. Money. <laughs> there was a Brock Lesnar sighting. So you take a look at this picture. Picture. picture, picture. You take a look at this picture that we're going to bring up here of Brock Lesnar, who was on this bearded butcher show. And if if this wrestling thing doesn't work out, he can be now a butcher. So I mean, is he going to be now the wow. beast or the butcher, Brock Lesnar? Either way, I still go pay to see him cut up meat. That's how good I think this man is. But and the beast. talk about the, talk about yeah, I know he could be part of the butcher, the blade, and the beast or the butcher. Um, what are your thoughts on Brock Lesnar uh, sporting that new do? I like him, man. He's I, rocking it. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. Um, Brock has never been known to have really good hairdos in his career. You know, this one works. I like this one. It, it really does work for him. I have always liked him with facial hair. Yeah. I didn't like him when he was clean shaven, especially in yeah. his last UFC. UFC, fight. right? With that yeah. beard when he had that run. We faced Cain Velasquez, yeah. his, last, his second to last fight in the UFC. Looked awesome. So intimidating, especially for a guy of Brock Lesnar's size. And eventually you did away with it. And he had these little weird top hair. I'm not one to complain. My hair sometimes looks yeah. good now. It looks like a mess at times. But this, this weird little like uh, yamaka thing on his top of the head looks terrible. This looks really good. And, uh, and, and he rocks it. Why not? I mean, I just so think- much so. So much so that Hammerstone chimed in and thought that they could be twins or he could be a son. Spin an image, I believe, of Alexander Hammerstone. And Brock Lesnar. It looks like if Brock Lesnar and Hulk Hogan had a baby, you would have Alexander Hammerstone, who, by the way, won MLW Riot and uh, the Battle Riot three, and now is can you know vie for that championship. Congratulations, Alexander Hammerstone. But man, spin image. Wow. Exactly. It's like he even went on Twitter. <laughs> and was like, Daddy. <laughs> it's like it really was. They're the spitting image of each other. It's ridiculous. It is scary too in a little in a lot of ways. But uh yeah, dude. Brock Lesnar rocking the look. I'm so happy for Hammerstone. Man, dude. Again, the look works. Stick with it. Will we see Brock Lesnar by the end of the year? I think so. I think so. Money talks, money walks. It, it's not the right time to bring him back just because it's SummerSlam. You are trying to make it a big event, but you know, let's let's look later down the road when the summer's over and people are regularly in the building. I think that's where the money will be there. People want to see Brock again. And you even said it too. You've said it several times when we did the oh, show. I'm finger you said, pointed at me. Exactly. You said several times on the show, people, you are going to miss Brock Lesnar oh, when he's my, gone. And that's all people talk about. Yes, and now everyone is talking about Brock Lesnar. Is he coming back? He's not. Oh, this is the so same man. The, the same oh. man that people wanted out because he's ruining the business. He doesn't defend the universal title. We well, you know what? It was a guy like Brock Lesnar that made that title worth what Roman Reigns is making it now. So you yeah. know what? Instead of you know worrying about whether Brock comes back or not, learn to appreciate what you had, and then maybe, maybe if the price is right, he'll come back. All right, Trent, so let's go now. Slammiversary is this weekend. Uh, two huge matches. We got Deanna Perrazzo taking on a mystery opponent. Boy, these mystery opponents, you got a kind of feeling it's going to be one of those people that's been released from WWE. It's, got, it's full of surprises. It's their WrestleMania. Chelsea Green. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, oh, oh, okay. So Sorry. Oh, that match up there is there for the Women's Championship. But let's, and again, We'll have predictions for Slammiversary as well on our social media. Go to yes. High Spot Podcast uh, on Twitter and on Instagram. Go to HG Media Network. We will have our predictions for Slammiversary there as well. A lot of wrestling this weekend, man. And it's a good thing. And we get to the main event, Slammiversary. Kenny Omega versus Sammy Callahan this Saturday on pay-per-view. Uh, this is... This is going to be a very good match. This is something worth watching. Uh, these two in the ring, Kenny Omega, the belt collector, 
Is he like ready? That. Is he is he going to lose to Sammy Callahan? If anyone deserves it, it's Sammy Callahan. If anyone deserves to be the face of Impact Wrestling, it is him. Is it that time? But it's going to be a heck of a ride, a heck of a fight to watch. Kenny Omega and Sammy Callahan. Listen, Scott Demore said that Kenny Omega's been what they had needed as the champion. He's he, he's going to fight at Slammiversary. This is huge for Kenny Omega. You can slight Impact Wrestling all you want. You're champion on two promotions, and you're going back and forth, and you're taking on the quality of opponents like you have. Moose, Sammy Callahan. Uh, this is big, man. This is big time. But I just don't see Sammy Callahan beating Kenny Omega. I still see Kenny, Kenny Omega walking away the Impact World Champion. I do too. I do think it's uh, the way they want to get it done. I mean, whatever the agreement between AEW and Impact has been, and I'm sure a lot of people say, you know what, this helps Impact doesn't help them at all in terms of you're basically just slaying them and making a secondary company. Yes, I agree with that to a certain degree, but if the payoff is that eventually the belts will be coming off of Kenny and someone like, for example, Sam McCallahan were to defeat Kenny, how big would that be? How impactful would it be for that individual who does it? I think it will eventually be Sam McCallahan, Cam McCallahan, can't speak today because you said it yourself too. He deserves, I don't think anybody deserves anything, Jeff. Sam McCallahan has, has proven to me that he's earned that right. He has been the face of impact for quite some time, although a lot of people don't want to admit it. And as much as this is going to be a great match in terms of technically in the ring, because both guys are very good in the ring, what I enjoy most about this is that the storytelling behind it is so good. Right. And guys like Sammy and Kenny can bring you in of not only the story of what's being told on the microphone, but the story that's being told in the ring. And I give a, a tremendous amount of credit for a guy like Kenny, who there's been talk that he is injured and he's not 100%. And he's dealing with this and, and is basically taking this opportunity and cutting it out. And for a guy like Sammy, a great opportunity. I don't think it will happen at Slam University, but I think eventually it will because to me, besides anybody else, not besides, nobody else on this roster for Impact, to me, is believable enough to beat Kenny but a guy like Sammy Callahan, not because of the technical standpoint from how they how they uh, measure up uh, side by side, but in terms of storytelling, these two are amazing, and it's going to be a great match. So you got tons of wrestling this weekend. You got Slammiversary Saturday. You got Money in the Bank uh, on Sunday. So you have a wrestler's smorgasbord mm. of wrestling, a fan's smorgasbord of wrestling uh, like this that. weekend. So definitely catch it, support wrestling. Uh, it's 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 great, man. It's back. The live crowds. Once we come back next week, we'll talk about the live crowds coming back towards WWE. We'll talk about Money in the Bank as well, and heading into SummerSlam, we got a huge announcement next week for you guys. Uh, maybe a guest or two. Uh, you never know with us, but uh, we promise we'll make it another great show for you. I'm gonna wrap it up here really quick and offer our condolences because the past two weeks we lost two legends in the Patriot, Del Wilkes and Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. Heartbreaking. We sent our condolences to the families, two legends we lost these last couple of weeks. Yes, uh, couldn't say any better, Jeff. Our thoughts and prayers are with the families. And, uh, you know, I I'm sure a lot of people maybe weren't huge fans of the Patriot, but he did have a, a lasting impact in the industry. And, and Mr. Wonderful pa Paul Orndorff, man, Hall of Famer. Uh, and again, I, he's another individual, too, that I've, you know, since it happened, I look back and then I see what people have to say about Paul Orndorff, and I don't really see a lot of people say anything bad about this guy. He's a man who lived his gimmick. He lived it. He breathed it. And that's why he was so good in it, because he was Mr. Wonderful. Heaven has gained two legends up in the squared circle in the sky. Definitely trendsetter. We are the Jersey Wrecking Crew. I am Jeff Martin alongside my tag team partner, the trendsetter. He's got to catch a flight. So take it away, trendsetter, before you fly into the sky for Chicago Exotica Weekend. Adventures with the Trendsetter is back, baby. It's back, guys. You asked for it. I am delivering it to you guys because we are the Jersey Wrecking Crew, like the scoundrel just said. And I do this. We do this for one reason and one reason only since day one. We do this for you, the crew. Hey, Trendsetter, can you give me a souvenir? No.